You are listening to Making a Scientist, the podcast that's by young scientists for young scientists. Please make sure to keep subscribing and engaging with our Twitter and YouTube platforms and rate us on the podcast platform that you're listening from. This helps us out a huge deal with the metrics and would be very much appreciated. This week, my guest is Professor Sean Harding, who is a professor of cardiac pharmacology at the National Heart and Lung Institute at Imperial College London. She's the director of the British Heart Foundation Cardiovascular Regenerative Medicine Centre and is also the campus director for Hammersmith and White City. She is also one of the world's leading experts on broken heart syndrome. Sean is London born and bred and gives a deeply honest account of her experiences in science, which is very humbling from a scientist at the top of her field. In this episode, here Sean and I discuss broken heart syndrome, hearts out of sync and artificial hearts. Sean tells us all about her path to professor, discusses what it is like as a working parent, and highlights how interfacing with the arts has been influential in her creative thinking process. I can't wait to share this episode with you all and get your feedback, so without any further ado, let's begin. Professor Sean Harding, thank you very, very much for joining us today. Um, I'd like to start, if I may, by asking you about what your research is and what is its impact in the world. Oh, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for, for inviting me on. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm working on basically heart failure. I'm, I'm interested in uh, the syndrome that happens when uh, the heart gets damaged for any kind of reason or underpowered and um, then goes into this syndrome where you have breathlessness and fatigue. It's not like a heart attack, it's, um, it's a much slower syndrome. And whereas we're actually getting quite good at treating heart attacks, uh, heart failure is increasing in the population. And there's probably about you know, nearly a million people living with heart failure in the UK at the moment. Um, so that was the reason. Um, uh, yeah, um, I'm... Uh, uh, interested in in the card the heart itself and in the, the cells of the heart particularly the cardiomyocytes and um, I was one of the first people who was able to sort of get them out of the heart and look at them in an in individual basis when you put them in a dish they beat like tiny hearts they look like little <laughs> little and um, sort of uh, bricks in, in shape stripy bricks but they they contract and relax um, when you when you put a, a current across them. And so they beat away, and then you can record many things from them, uh, and and uh, do impale them with electrodes, all sorts of things. And so, uh, <laughs> so, so there is a, a very nice experiment to do. Um, I didn't start off doing that, but I, I, uh, I um, went on to that during my postdoc. Uh, actually, mm-hmm. to, I have to say that my um, my uh, supervisor at the time, my boss, who was the boss of the institute. Uh, expressly forbade me to study cardiomyocytes, expressly. But then he went on sabbatical <laughs> for a year, and, and so I got the whole thing up, and he was quite impressed when he got back. So that was fine in the end. Nice. <laughs> so, so I'm just wondering about these, uh, these syndromes. Uh, so uh, you, know, you and I know each other, um, but I, I wondered if you wouldn't mind explaining this, this phenomenon that is known as broken heart syndrome, because I think that's, that's it's a fascinating thing, and particularly with Valentine's Day coming up many people might suffer from uh, broken heart syndrome. So, so what, is, what is that? Well, it is true that they, they say, can you die of a broken heart? And um, yes, indeed, um, it, you, you can. And it's, there's a classic syndrome where there's a two, two old people often die within days of each other. In fact, statistically speaking, you're very strongly much more likely to die on the day after your spouse than than any day in the next six months for example and it's sort of a, a, a descending curve during that time so it's, it's a real thing a statistical thing that's um, fascinating yeah <laughs> that's, yeah no that's fascinating i just wondered as well because um I, I can't remember where i've heard this from but i i heard that people are also more likely to die around about their birthday is that true there, no there's a the thing called the anniversary reaction so it's okay. the it's the, around the anniversary of 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 a, a, a stressful event like a, like a bereavement particularly a, bere- a bereavement, so there's okay. there's a reaction around that time, um, 
Uh, I I don't I've never heard that they, there there is one other um, thing you might have heard which is uh, that the it was observed that surprise birthday parties could be a trigger for this this as well. <laughs> no way. Yes. <laughs> so 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 it's really a question of very strong emotion and and it's a strong emotional or physical stress and and it's uh, it all centres around adrenaline. Um, and adrenaline is great for starting your heart up and great for keeping, you know, helping to run fast. But it does produce very strong arrhythmias if you have too much of it. Um, and and it's, it's what people experience when they, they die from a broken heart is, is um, uh, sudden cardiac death, basically. They, their heart goes into fibrillation and they, they, within a few minutes, they become unconscious and, and, and if they're not resuscitated. Uh, with a defibrillator, then they will die. But, mm-hmm. and, and you, mm-hmm. you might have, uh, want to stop me at some point, because I, I get on to this, there is another broken heart syndrome, <laughs> which... No, is, this is fascinating. Yeah, Please, go, called, go. Called <laughs> Takatsubu cardiomyopathy. And that's, again, a classic broken heart syndrome. Then you, this one, you can die of it, but you don't, it, it's actually much more benign. Um, so what happened here? Uh, what happens here is you get this adrenaline stress, but in in the, what happens is the heart uh, dilates and, and as in, becomes stunned in a in a spatially uh, uh, distinct way, and so what happens is you often have contraction, very strong contraction at the top of the heart, but no contraction at the bottom, and so you get a thing that with, with a, that looks on the X-ray like a narrow neck. And that's, um, it was first seen in Japan uh, mm-hmm. and it's um, during earthquake, during earthquake when they were getting lots of people in and they, because they could image it in a particular way, they saw it. And um, uh, it looked like a, an octopus put, pot, which is called a Takatsubu. And so that's why oh, it's called okay. Takatsubu syndrome. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, and the interesting thing about this is that the people, people come in, they think they are having a heart attack. And uh, they've got all the symptoms. They, they've got the, the chest pain. They've got the heart failure. They've got the um, uh, ECG changes. But, uh, they, and some do die at that point, but most recover and, and within days, their hearts are normal again. So is it something to do with um, a, tr- a kind of a transient emotional event? Like you feel something really strongly and then once that feeling goes, you're back to normal? Is that how it goes in a sense yes because it's an acute effect of adrenaline but it's doing something slightly different and this is what i i uh, first came up with this um explanation mm-hmm. uh is that the um the adrenaline can uh, through the beta 2 receptor can switch to a different pr- pathway and it kind of shuts the heart down but it protects it from the arrhythmias because when we when we investigated this, we managed to reproduce this in a model, an animal model, a rat, an anesthetized rat, and mm-hmm. when we we worked out the pathway, but then when we tried to block the pathway, we got sudden cardiac death. So so adrenaline can go down two different pathways, and it can go down a, 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 a pathway that that let's say transiently cu- shuts the heart down. And uh, then when the adrenaline has gone, the, the heart recovers uh, after some time. Um, oh, wow. Yes. I, w- I just wondered then, so the ultimate aim of your research, what, uh, and, and, and coming out of your lab, so what is it you're specifically trying to address? I, 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 can I, I, I'm sorry, I just wanted to finish. You might have to wait oh, sure. I, but the, the key thing, the between, difference between those two syndromes is that 80 to 90% of Sudden cardiac death is, is, happens in men, but 80 to 90% of Takatsubu happens in postmenopausal females. Oh, wow, really? So, so men are more emotional, is this? Uh, no, it's, it's, um, <laughs> it's that the, 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 um, the, the basically estrogen protects against arrhythmia. And okay. when the arrhythmia starts to wear off, my hypothesis is that the the women are passing through a, a stage where they're not quite protected, but they have this this intermediate syndrome. Okay. Uh, so so we're, we're we're going into an estrogen deficient uh, state, 
And I have to say, though, that when I say postmenopause <laughs> women, most people uh, are not very interested in curing. The mo- it's very difficult <laughs> to get funding for this disease because, um, uh, first, uh, people recover from it, uh, classically. And second, um, you know, you're, you're, what you're doing is you're rescuing a small pool of postmenopausal women, and basically there's enough of them around anyway, aren't there? <laughs> 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 so, so, um, so, so, with all of these activities coming out of your lab, which what's what's your chief aim? What's the ultimate aim of your research? To mend these broken hearts? Uh, yes, and we we we're thinking about different ways of doing this, and I've tried some gene therapy. And at the moment, I'm looking at cells, uh, pluripotent stem cells, which, uh, and one nice thing we're doing at the moment is making these 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 stem cells, which you can you can actually make from. A skin sample from a person for anybody or a blood sample you can you can make those into stem cells and then you can make those stem cells into cardiac heart cells and they don't quite look the same as the bricks that we get but they do beat very strongly and so what the the question we now want to know is how can we use these of course which which will be immunologically matched to the person how can we use them to 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 reduce, restore the cardiac muscle that's lost, because because unfortunately cardiac muscle isn't very good at, at, at regenerating itself. So it, what we're looking at now is an engineering problem, really, and so uh, uh, that's where I am with 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 that research. Fascinating. Thanks. I'd like to then talk about when you were young. So if you could take us right back to where you grew up and where you're from. Uh, so I'm from the East End of London um, okay. and uh, we, uh, we lived there until I was a teenager and then my father got a little bit more, um, more money and, and we went, moved to just out into Essex uh, in, in, then from there. Um, so it's called the Midwife Territory is where I was born. The time and the place is both coincides with that, so I'm quite <laughs> historical in that okay. respect. Um, and my parents were both artists, so you know, I was a complete mystery to them, really. So they, 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 they. <laughs> <laughs> are you an only child, or are there? No, I've, got, I've got two two younger brothers. Are they artists, or do they follow the science path? Uh, so um, uh, one of them was more scientific. Um, and still does um, uh, a lot of coding. He did a lot of coding. Uh, um, the other one became a, a civil servant. Became a civil, so we went, went quite up in the civil service. So um, he he was different from both of us. Yeah, very diverse. Okay, so so what did you then study when you were an undergraduate? Um, I studied um, pharmacology, biochemistry, and pharmacology actually at King's okay. King's College London. Um, I I uh, I always wanted to uh, do something biological, and I was I just found pharmacology while flicking through the Ucas handbook, UK, uh, and yeah. I found and, and w- wonder what it was. R- was a, looked it up. Found it was a study of drugs. This was the you know we're going from uh, late sixties to seventies now, early seventies. So, See, you know, pretty I, popular, right? Yeah, <laughs> I always like to call the course recreational pharmacology, and uh, <laughs> and, and uh, <laughs> the department was there was lovely. It was um, they were all kind of you know hippie blokes really, and and they 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 was very female. They 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 were very. Um, uh, happy to have lots of women around. They they liked they like brought on female scientists. There's a there's a whole generation, uh, especially in London, of uh, female pharmacologists who originate at that department in Kings. You know, so we've got oh, wow. Sarah, Sarah Rankin and Sue Brain and all sorts of people like that. Um, uh, so yes, uh, we that that just immediately called to me the pharmacology. <laughs> Fair enough. So, when you were finishing up with your ph- pharmacology degree, I'm sure you, uh, you, you there was uh, some uh, rigorous scientific experimentation going on with these pharmacological compounds. But um, what did you? Uh, what did you? <laughs> what did you then uh, do after you uh, you graduated, or what did you? What did you want to do? Um, so I um, never completely knew what was. I never had my path very highly mapped out. 
I knew I wanted to be a scientist from, from you know, the age of nine, really. Okay. What, why? What, why does that stick out? Uh, because I remember that one of the dinner ladies asking me what I wanted to do when I grew up, and I said, I want to cut up dead bodies. <laughs> God, right. It's like future serial killer alert. That's right. So I, 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 I like to think it was because I wanted to be a scientist rather than a serial killer. Um, uh, uh, so um, uh, about sort of as I was coming to the end of my second year, beginning of my third year, uh, they said to me, would you like to do, at uh, King's, they said to me, would you like to do a PhD? And I said, I don't know what's a PhD then. And so they <laughs> <laughs> they explained it to me. I said, that sounds just, that sounds right. Yeah, I'll do that then. And then they said, well, um, would you like to decide what, what you want to do uh, with your, you know, would you like to go and find a title? So they just sent me off into the library to find something to experiment on. Uh, wow. Yes, yeah, so that's great. That's wow. So, so then, did you carry on doing uh, pharmacological research within your PhD? Yes. So I did. I started off with, with cardiac. Then um, they. So when I was trying to decide what what to do, I talked to all the lecturers in the department, and I was a couple of other things I would have liked to do. One was neuro, uh, but when I saw what the, the techniques were like with neuro. Basically, it was cutting up brain regions and measuring metabolites in them at that point. You know, they, and the only one you could reasonably identify was the stri- uh, Niagara striata, uh, uh, because it was black. And, and I thought that was just hopeless, really. Come on, yeah. just get, you know, give me a break. And uh, the other one I fancied doing was, um, uh, I, I, did, I didn't bother to do biology for my A-levels, uh, because I thought oh. I can make that up, really. Uh, learning stuff. Um, so I did maths, maths and physics and chemistry. I did three maths A levels. I, I like maths. So I thought maybe I'll do maths, uh, something mathematical um, in the biological way. But I went, okay. al- I went along to a course. I went on a course uh, for that. And it was, all, it was all partial differential equations. And I have to tell you, and this will sh- I, 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 I hesitate to tell people this nowadays because it really <laughs> does date me so much. When I was, I, I, when, I was um, uh, uh, when I went to university, there were no um, computers. There were no personal computers. I, went, when I married before I went to university. And mm-hmm. my husband and I brought together as a joint wedding present to each other, the very first calculator. (laughs) (laughs) And it did plus, minus, divide and multiply. And I got a job on the back of that because I took a year off before we got married to earn some money because we really wanted to get married. Um, And I got a job in a factory doing the uh, wages and the bonuses because they said, can you work a contometer? And I said, no. But I have a calculator of my own, and they were so impressed <laughs> that because no, yeah, yeah. it cost wow. it cost forty two pounds then, that which was enormously expensive. Mm. So roughly, what is that in, in in today's kind of money? Well, the flat we bought at the time cost mm-hmm. nine thousand pounds. So okay. so so you know you've got to scale it up from so that's probably probably yeah. fifty times for, for, for you know. Wow. Yeah. Um, so that's the, I, I think property has got that more, so probably it wasn't quite quite as bad as that. And, and um, <laughs> for one of my first Christmases when we were married, my husband um, hired for me the first personal co- pet computer, and it was a, it was it was it was a portable, but like a portable like a microwave oven is portable, and we we <laughs> carried it about from because we went to visit people at Christmas. And we carried it about and put it in the corner, and I would sit and code in the corner while everybody else had Christmas, and so that was that was brilliant. <laughs> Sounds fantastic. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Anyway, what's so... it? So anyway, so I was say I would try mathematics, mm-hmm. and so we could. We, it was differential equations, but there was nothing yeah. to solve them on. So you could you could do two, two at mm. once, and, and again. Yeah, I could see that was completely hopeless. So the cardiac stuff I liked, and um, uh, and my father-in-law had heart failure at the time, so that was another uh, another sort of 
you know, incentive from that from that point of view. Uh, so yeah. I went in to to do the cardiac one. Oh, fair enough. So, did you, did you always picture yourself as a as a scientist in uh, going down the academic track, or did you ever uh, did you ever consider going into into industry? I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> I, I had completely no idea. I wanted. To, I knew I wanted to be a scientist. I didn't. I don't know even how I knew that. Quite honestly, because I that there was so little possibility for me to even find out what that even meant. <laughs> um, and and I, I have to tell you this because again, it's just going to annoy people. Honestly, I ne- again I never tell the young people this because um, uh, my I I went to do I did a PhD. Uh, then yeah. I which I failed. I have to tell you that I failed my oh, PhD. Oh please, yeah. Um, how how did you fail? Uh, I I I had for my PhD. I had a nature paper, right? Wow! Um, and and failed. I failed. I bet. I, and I'm sure I just annoyed the examiner because I had the nature paper, and um, it was, I had another paper in British Journal of Pharmacology, uh, where I'd done um, the, the the experiment. It was on warbane. I was looking at what well, digitalis glycosides, and I was looking to see. I wanted to see. I knew that the they were produced sodium overload at high concentrations. But there was some theory that they flipped at low concentrations and actually uh, ran the other way. They, they, they stimulated the sodium potassium ATPase. So I loaded up the cells with um, uh, veractrine, with sodium, and uh, did this response curve. And, they, and the guy said, I sh- uh, so there, was, there wasn't in fact any, anything at the lower end. But the guy said I should do more, I should have done more at the higher end. And I know he was wrong, I knew he was wrong then. But he, he, he failed me for that. So I had to go back into the lab and do some more experiments and come back and show, yes, it's the same. Oh. So how long did it take you to do that? And that was published experiment? work, which was really irritating too. Uh, sorry. Wow. Yes. Yeah, yeah, no, how long did it take then to, you know, just uh, redo these experiments and get past? Uh, so perhaps about six months. So, wow. And then they just told me over the phone, yes, that, that's all right, you've passed now. But. Yeah, it's, it's, it sounds like he had a gripe. This guy definitely. Um, nature, nature is one of those very, yeah, uh, very, very exclusive uh, things. So yeah, really well done for that. Um, but okay, I suppose. Yeah, uh, then so so you... I was going to say what I was going to say was I went I went to do a postdoc um, in the in the Cardiothoracic Institute, and um, uh, the the um, my I went on a, on a five year postdoc and first. My boss came to, to say to me, uh, I, I've, just, I've swapped you from a postdoc to a technician because uh, that, that gives you a permanent job. Is that all right? Okay, fine. Um, <laughs> and uh, then uh, he came to me a couple of years later and said, um, uh, I've, I've made you a lecturer now. And I said, oh, great, that's lovely. Do I have to give you the lectures? And he said, no, no. I thought, that's fine, good. That's how it what I was doing, you know. And, and that's just annoying. That's just annoying now, isn't it? It, it is. I don't think that would happen uh, nowadays. But you must have done something exceptional. Uh, or, or, you know, you must have been really highly regarded. So I think maybe you're downplaying that a little bit. So, yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, you, your sort of, um, your, your path was more of a... Uh, serendipitous path shall we say um then uh what what advice would you give to a young person these days who is about to enter either an undergraduate a postgraduate or or a post phd position um what would the advice for all three be the same or would you would you uh tailor advice differently oh um well um an undergraduate um i i guess you know, you just what you what you want to do. I would say, I'd, I'd say it was quite a bad idea to base a, a, a scientific career if it just because they're your best A levels. I think it, it's it's such a, a chancy career that 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 that's not a, a great choice. So you might want to think about some other things. Um, mm-hmm. PhD, uh, I can actually. For the to go to going to a postgraduate, I, perhaps I can give you the example of what I was what when my daughter was going to do yeah, not, a, not a not a PhD but a declin sci, 
she's a clinical psychologist, and she was thinking about a thesis um, and who she should, how, what she should do. And um, I was suggesting that she shouldn't pick a, a, a starry kind of person. Uh, she shouldn't pick a very young person who, who hadn't supervised before. And she shouldn't pick one of these, you know, people who are always on an aeroplane. In fact, she did want to go and work with somebody who was a bit like that, but she had another sort of co-supervisor at UCL who was very, very nice and solid and like the guys I used to know at King's, you know, really just like straightforward bloke. And um, so he was there to have her back. And, and as predicted, the other guy was just would swan in every now and again and say, you know, give an impossible instruction and go away again. Uh, but she had, a, and I also said, try and find a place with a good postdoc because they're the ones that are looking after you really, honestly. Um, mm -hmm. And so she, she, she did that. So uh, the, that, that worked out all right. So what makes a good postdoc? Oh, just a, you know, well, I say, I, I'm, I'm sure she couldn't have understood. I mean, <laughs> so a lab where there's, there's support, a lab where she's not the only person doing something, a lab where there's a lot of people around who are, um, uh, you know, working for the same person, like a family. Yeah, that, that's a, that's a, 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 a place where you'll, you'll have some support, even if your boss is away, is, is really, really what I was trying to say. Yeah, I see what you mean, totally. So then, um, uh, so we've had other people on this show and they've advised things about uh, going going abroad to do a postdoc, um, but you, that's something that you never did? No, um, uh, so they, my, I was offered to go as on a sabbatical uh, to um, wherever I wanted, really. But as I say, I, I was married by that time, um, by the time I was 18, so... Um, uh, I didn't really want to because uh, I I think you know, my husband had a proper job. He was you know, he was fine. He was he's a telling you know he's great. So I didn't really want to leave him, and I think that's the fastest way possible to get divorced. Is, honestly, is to is to have a long distance relationship. So I decided not to. I can't say it was a very hard decision, uh, really. And so so I am I I have basically just hung around the place. So I have managed to get from technician to professor and then from professor to, you know, briefly at least, head of the institute, um, just by hanging around. So, um, uh, you know, people, people say you've got to get your BTA, your Been to America, you, you know, you've got to do this, you've got to go to many labs. There are other ways. I just, just uh, you know, if you want to answer any reassurance about that. So for the next section, I'd like to discuss your experiences, science. So I'm going to start by asking, what has been your most memorable experience in science as a whole? Um, I have to say, it was when I thought of that, that when I understood suddenly that the beta blockers were agonists and that they were agonists at the same pathway that was causing the Takotsubu syndrome. And that's how they were protecting the heart, and that's why they were also cardiodepressant. And I'm not sure I've, I've convinced the world of this, but I just <laughs> suddenly saw it, and uh, it all fell into place. And I've had, I've had the experience a number of times of suddenly realising something, of having a scientific insight. But that was that was so dramatic that the the rearrangement that went on in my head and and uh, that's the, my most memorable experience. So where did where did this inspiration strike? Like did did you we is is this a shower thought? Is this a um, you know like a walk in um, just going for a nice like after after work walk? Um, what, what how did you figure? It, well, I was basically so. I was just thinking about it. I, I, was, I, I remember I distinctly, I was sitting on one sofa. And my husband was on the other sofa with my daughter because it was uh, something had happened. She couldn't go to school. It was a snow day or something. I don't know what. But she couldn't mm -hmm. go to school. And so we were all just sitting around together. You know, and I was just thinking about something. And then it just <laughs> suddenly came to me. <laughs> it's strange that how it can just all out of a sudden, just, just all of a sudden, just out of nowhere, just... 
yeah, pop into your mind. That's crazy. So um, let's take you back to when you were a student. Uh, what was the biggest challenge that you faced? Um, I don't know. Well, the student wasn't that. I didn't. It wasn't hugely. I mean, I suppose it was. Uh, there was. Uh, I suppose failing the PhD could be one thing. That Not was true. a bit. A bit of a nuisance, but. Um, uh, actually, the first six months of the PhD, so I, I decided to do something um, with the digitalis glycotides, and I was actually looking at them with taurine because there was a, there was a report that that was uh, prevented the arrhythmias. So I tried to reproduce that, and I tried every way I could. I could not reproduce the original thing, um, and uh, you know I had so much taurine it was crystallizing in the in the syringe, and and so. Um, uh, I had to, I had to re, I had to redo. I'd start from the beginning again, uh, you know, and after a bit, and I, so, so I would say to people, you know, just don't keep, just don't keep chasing the same thing all over again. Um, and so I had to decide on something else to do, and uh, I did it with cardiac glycosides, and it was about calcium handling and things. Um, but that was that was challenging, I suppose, and, and then then the failing thing, um, and so I. I there was a, somebody I was doing a thesis for, uh, and, and they um, had a similar experience. They were trying to get uh, grow some some stem cell cardiomyocytes stem cells into endothelial cells. I think it was something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and they tried. Uh, there was a particular protocol, and they tried it every which way, and and they never got anything at all. It was a most depressing thesis, but they they you know they'd done it properly, and so they. They knew their things, so they passed. And I and they and I said to the person, "Well, what would you do? Um, uh, you know, in the future now, what, what how would you like to go forward?" They they said, "You know, I'd like to try this protocol again, but I'd just like to do this and this." And I, I just don't, just stop, just stop, do something else, anything. <laughs> <laughs> um, so then, uh, what was the best piece of advice that somebody ever gave you? Um, it was. It's not what you can do, it's what you can persuade other people to do for you. <laughs> <laughs> who, who gave you this advice? Alan, you a guy names. called Alan Williams, who sadly oh, passed okay. away. He was uh, in, in the department with me, nice guy. Um, uh, he, so basically, what is, so, you know, I, I designed the cardiomyocyte thing myself, and, and I like to do that. But you can't pin yourself to... Uh, one thing if you want to answer a question you can't just say but so many people do this they have a technique and they look for questions that they can answer but that's the wrong way around you should want to answer something and find the best technique to do it and so if you do that and you can see very clearly now you can't just do it with one thing you need you need a team to do it you need lots of different people and and you, in order to do that, you need to persuade them to do it either by paying them or collaborating with them or something. So yeah, buying and, them a pint, yeah, sorry. <laughs> or buying them a pint, you know. Indeed, that that can work. Um, so you have to do it, and and the problem is you have to give up control because you never. I can I know everything about the cardiomyocytes. Nobody knows more than I do, um, but. I have to do many things I don't know about and I have to only go in there with common sense and you know you can find that as much but you can't you can't be expert on everything and you but you Mm. need those experts with you and I think one thing I never realized I never really realized till quite late on was just how much you could ask people to do Um, just how much people you could go to any any and it's very true, isn't it, Alex, that you can go to any scientist and mostly they will answer you. If you say, how do I do this? What, what's wrong with this? How can you... Mostly people will, will, especially if you go up to them in person at a meeting or something, they won't turn you away. They won't be, they won't be too... I mean, I, I really haven't encountered anybody being too arrogant to not tell you. Most people are just attracted by the problem and the challenge, uh, I think. But yeah, it's just it's just something that a lot of people will, will really try and like crack a challenge by themselves. But for me, I'm realizing more and more that it's, it's, it's more about 
like you, you know you're talking about having other people to help um i'm i'm someone who used to think yeah I, I need to do this all by myself because i have to prove something i really need to prove a point that i'm that i'm you know capable and 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 everything but you you don't necessarily need to do that and it's it's not a sign of weakness to ask for for help or a collaboration and i, I just kind of wanted to kind of like get that message across essentially so yeah yeah collaboration is is certainly key yeah, absolutely yeah. absolutely so, so now this is a this is a tough one, um, but what was the hardest decision of your career? I couldn't. Did you, well, I, you sort of. Yeah. I sort of suggested I might. I might have to uh, answer that, but I can't remember anything that was that hard. I mean, I can't remember. I mean, possibly, Just, possibly the hardest thing. It wasn't really a decision, but the hardest thing to do was to let go uh, and have people that 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 in my team that I didn't really I couldn't really help them or in a in a real way in in what they were doing and and understand why something might be going wrong um only try to find them help really or try to to use some common sense or try to help but 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 I didn't have the control over those whereas and and I also when I first had a, a, a group of of people, I was uh, I possibly micromanaging. I mean, I was always the person who knew where everything was in the fridge, you know, and and uh, things like that. And I knew every bit of it, and I could tell everybody how to do things. And I had to, I had to just give that up. A lot of people suffer with. Uh, things like imposter syndrome you know i'm not i'm not good enough to be doing this particularly if they if they encounter stressful periods so what would your top work life balance be um uh so um i mean i I've, I've always felt that i was doing what i'm doing for myself if you see what i mean uh, mm-hmm. and and so i mean you have to pay your dues to the university and things but i was always making it up as I went along and quite happy. I, I'm just happy to be left alone and we have <laughs> really to, to, to do things. And we have so much freedom. You, you know, if you don't think you've got freedom to do what you want, you're, you're not paying attention. Because, you know, how, uh, you know, nobody for, I, I can't, you know, can't count the number of years. Nobody has asked me where I am. I can be anywhere I like. I can say to, to the pe- you know, people around me, I'm just going to fly off to the States tomorrow <laughs> and I will do it. And, and nobody will say why or where, you know, have you filled in your sheet or whatever. So you have enormous amounts of freedom. And so actually you can arrange your work how you want. Mm. It's, you have much more freedom than you, any other job. Um, uh, it's when you start to have a lot of meetings that's the problem. Um, when you get into because there are two kinds of career you've got uh, you've got the career that we, where you're doing the science and then there's a whole other bit after that where you're leading things and running things but um, and then you've got a lot of meetings but you, you know when you're when you're in that bit where you're doing a, being a productive scientist nobody's telling you what to do um, if, if you're not taking the time you need then you should just take it so you just like be self-aware that you know I'm feeling a bit exhausted. Um, yeah, like I just I just need a little bit of time to my to to myself. Yeah, and you okay. you you can do that and you should do that. Um, because if you if you go on right working yourself too hard and burn in burnout or you or you're just working yourself too hard, so you get a bit run down, and then you're off with a cold for a week. Just think how much you could have done in that week. Um, so it's much easier to, to not get to that stage and then not have this build-up of, 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 of work. When my daughter was small, uh, so the first 10 years or so, um, mm-hmm. I just worked very, very strict hours. Uh, you know, I came at 9, I left at 5. We used to call it the mummy run because there was, uh, at 5 o'clock there was a load of women out the gate uh, to ride the ca- ca- train. Um, uh, and I didn't work at weekends at all, and I didn't do any of the other stuff that you've got, uh, which, you know, like, you know, um, reviewing papers or going to meetings or something like that. Mm-hmm. So I didn't do any of, I didn't do, I just did the core stuff, the important stuff, 
and uh, then I just concentrated on uh, my daughter for the rest of the time. Fair enough. Yeah, you just got in, got out, did your work, and yeah, and that and that was it. Yeah, because it must be it must be very difficult. I'm not at that stage yet where I'm, uh, uh, you know, it's just me. Um, so uh, I've not raised a family, but I can imagine it's really tough, like trying to um, trying to trying to arrange your life around these things. And I think a lot of people actually tend to uh, almost put things on hold, uh, especially you see in my generation and the and the one before, people are having children later. But this is not something that you did. You 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 seem to have just gone for it and you know, got ma- married at a young age just um and made everything sort of like fit around around your family life and uh <laughs> there's something i actually really admire because i probably should have done that uh, a little bit more as well but i suppose there's no there's no right or wrong path but it's just really interesting to see how different people have, have managed it so but, but yeah. honestly i mean i've i've basically i've gone to work worked come home again made the dinner uh, sat down watching TV in the evening, and and that's pretty much my lifestyle. And so I haven't, I've not done nothing heroic. But I mean, we did do the transplants. The transplants, I have to get up in the night, so that's one okay. thing that I did do. But only okay. because they're in the night, I couldn't do anything about that. Yeah. What are your passions outside of science? What do you like to do in your leisure time? Um. Uh, so uh, I I like uh, culture. I, that's one of the reasons we moved into London. I've always wanted to live as close to the centre of London as possible. And okay. um, I've always said I'd, I'd live in the furniture department of John Lewis if I could. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> the um, uh, and so that we can take advantage of all the the sort of nice cultural experiences. The London Film Festival is our big thing of the year. Um, we go to many, many films then. Um, uh, I'm, uh, you, as you know, I'm, I'm quite, uh, I like the art science uh, sort of uh, interface there because of my uh, artistic uh, roots, as it were. Um, mm-hmm. So uh, I, that, that's it, that hoovering up culture, I guess, is, is my, my thing. No, definitely. So um, during the pandemic then, uh, Culture is obviously a, a sector that has been really hit by the the effects of the pandemic. So, um, how have you how have you coped with that? Um, so, uh, actually, uh, it's not that bad. There were a lot of films have been streaming. The London Film Festival was partly online, which was quite convenient, actually. Um, <laughs> the uh, the galleries. There's been such nice um, uh, sort of uh, you know broadcasts from the galleries with quite a very knowledgeable people talking about things. I love Grace and Perry's Art Club, as, as you, uh, many people have. Did you see that? It's great. I, I haven't. No, no. What is, what, can you explain what that one is? Uh, so he was just a uh, great, you know, Grace and Perry. Uh, oh. So an artist. So he's an artist. He's a... <laughs> it shows how ill-cultured I am. This is terrible. <laughs> no, he's, 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 Sorry, but a lot of people do know him that don't know an artist, you see. So he's a very flamboyant person. He... He uh, has an alter ego, Claire, where he, where he dresses up, uh, he's a transvestite, and he's um, uh, married to a, a psychologist, uh, Philippa Perry. Um, and they, and, and in their place, they, they uh, just had a club where people sent in art, um, just you know, anybody could do that. And he, he chose it, they had some celebrities doing a bit as well. Uh, and um, it was just so very encouraging about, uh, you know, even if you don't think you're very good at art, uh, you, you might be able to do something. Um, uh, so uh, it, was, it was lovely, just lovely. Hmm. Um, what are you a passionate advocate for? Uh, I, I, uh, it's difficult to choose. Um, the, so I've ob- obviously I've had to um, uh, you know, fight the woman's corner for a... For a you know, and and hopefully look after some of the younger women as well, and a bit, if I can. So, uh, but that's a lot of it. It's that self interest, really, isn't it? And and the, you know, they're all you know my secret weapon. All these fantastic women. Um, so uh, then there's the the art there's the art science thing, and you you know we the, the Chisholm Hill work we've done yeah. and. Various other things I've done um, in terms of that, uh, working with different artists. Um, so, so that, 
Um, uh, the other thing I would say I, I, I was being a very passionate advocate for is um, the movement of, of cardiology uh, or the integration of cardiology with the hard sciences, uh, the physical, mathematical, engineering type of sciences. And so I've always, I've, wherever I've been in the organisation, I've tried to push or make schemes that push those two together. The PhD schemes that have the two supervisors, uh, the Centre of Research Excellence, uh, all those things. So, so I, I would have, I would pick some of those type of things. Do you think that your creative background and the fact that you've always been interested in in the arts, do you think that's helped with your creative thinking when it comes to science? I've often thought that the the, the creativity of, is very similar between the, the two aspects. Um, uh, there's a story I've often told, which is my father, who was a photographer, so he learned his living as a photographer, uh, and he uh, did, uh, you know, for his own interest, art photography, uh, sort of just in his spare time always. And he he took um, a, a series of, of photographs of a wall in the rubbish dump where people throw paint when they're throwing paint pots away. So they throw away the, the paint, throw the paint onto the wall, and then throw the paint pot away. And so obviously this changes with time. So he's been taking a series of this wall changing with time. And so he'd come up into, into Laura, but rubbish dump, put up his tripod and, and take photos. And people would come up to him and say to him, what are you doing? And he would say, um, after, for, for a while, after a, for a bit, for a first bit, he would explain to them what he was doing. And after a while, he got fed up with explaining, and he would just say, <laughs> and he'd just say, "Oh, I'm an artist," and they'd say, "Oh, right, you're an artist." And so, I reckon you could do the same if I was there, and I'd said, "Oh, I'm a scientist," they'd say, "Oh, right, yes, you're a scientist," and they wouldn't understand what on earth you were doing, but they would just uh... <laughs> yeah, they'd respect it. They'd be like, "Oh gosh, right, okay." <laughs> <laughs> On to our final thoughts. So what would your advice be to young people right now? A lot of people are uh, struggling with, uh, with, with the effects of the pandemic and it's going to be around for a long time, let's, let, let's be honest. What, what would you say to these young people? Um, well, um, I would say that probably that just science is just a great career. I mean, it's it's a bit like London. Nobody can afford to live in London, but yet there are 8 million people living in London. So it's the same. Nobody can possibly get to be a scientist. It's far too hard to get up the, the scientific ladder. But yet there's loads of people that are scientists. And all the people that I knew when I was young are all gainfully employed in one kind of science or another. Maybe not in academia, but they're all doing something very nice in in. Um, in in councils or in in biotechs or in something and and so you uh you know you may not get you know the the classic academic pathway but there'll always be something nice and it's just a great it's just such a great job to have when you go in and and something new can happen every day you you can find out something nobody knew about um, in <laughs> fact, I, I really don't. I don't like writing papers because I I don't really want to tell people. I like knowing the thing myself. You know? <laughs> it's true I, for for myself as well. I do actually like the fact that when I've done an experiment and I've got this piece of data that's hot off the press at that one moment in time, I am the world's foremost expert in this because no one else has done it. I only me. I, I only I know. So I do. I do enjoy that. <laughs> <laughs> um. So. How do you see the future of your field? Um, uh, one of the reasons I wanted to go into stem cell science was because um, I was a bit worried about the, the, the cardiac field in that we were possibly, di- you know, in the science thing, thing, digging down more and more into, uh, you know, details and, and whether there was a, a sort of... Um, uh, a future in it. I mean, if, if the LVADs um, uh, c- can have a battery that lasts a reasonable amount of time, I think maybe we're out of a job, honestly. So, sorry, LVAD? L- oh, left ventricular assist devices. If, if they, okay. if they, they can, but uh, I'm, I'm probably uh, being too, too pessimistic, but I did want that, that sort of um, 
a get out in this sense or sort of uh, expansion of, of, of my thoughts through through the stem cell field I, I think the cardiac field um, uh, as I, as I said it's it's uh, bringing in the uh, the public health bringing in the epidemiology bringing in the engineering bringing in the bioinformatics etc that's the way it's going to go it, it has to expand out uh, and, and touch many disciplines and also it has we have to think of it not as um, stop thinking of it as just cardiology but but in ter- terms of the multi morbidities uh, um, mm. sort of uh, agenda where when when you get a number of disease when you get to a certain age you have a number of diseases um, and it's quite difficult to disentangle those things one from another and it's almost it's almost a chance whereas you're whether you're diagnosed if you've got breathlessness whether your your COPD is caught first or your or, or your cardiac disease because they they occur so often together so, so working in the field of regenerative medicine as you do um, and especially with stem cells uh, this this might seem like a, a ridiculous question but how far away are we from growing a heart um, uh, the the uh, it, it seems to have been quite difficult more difficult new because of the nature of cardiomyocytes in terms of uh, populating any of those decellularized scaffolds uh, so so it, it's it's um, we we can make the cells, but as I say now, it's an engineering problem, and the the engineering of the heart is so amazing in itself <laughs> that the problem is we're just not good enough for it. They they do you know they they started to make um, when they went when they were saying at the beginning of the sixties we'll get a man to the moon at the end of the sixties. They said something similar for an artificial heart, a a full artificial heart. Now, we've been to the moon, we've stopped going to the moon, we've gone back to the moon again, we've gone to Mars, we're going to Mars. We still don't have an off-the-shelf working full artificial heart. So it's really very difficult. And the problem with regenerative medicine and the heart is that whatever you try to do, if you try to stimulate the regeneration that's not very high in the heart, the, you disrupt the structure, and you can't disrupt the structure of the heart for very long. You want, well, I mean, as you know, the cells are breaking down, dividing, and, and reforming, they start to form arrhythmias. So if you ca- if you ever do manage to stimulate regeneration, uh, cardiomyocyte proliferation, then you get arrhythmias because the heart substrate is now disrupted. It's the same when you in, try to inject in these cardiomyocytes. As soon as you get a large number of their, them in there, they start to couple. Then you get arrhythmias because they're not yet the same as the heart wall. So the heart is so amazingly evolved to do its job. That's why we can't fix it. In science in general, which emerging trend do you see as having the greatest potential to affect any sort of change? Um, well, it has to be the mathematics, really, I think. Uh, it's it's the, the big okay. data stuff is just amazing. Uh, and I... And I um, uh, wish in a way, if I, if I, that I, when it, it first started to evolve into something that was useful, that I'd gone back in and kept up with that at that point, because uh, I think I would have liked to do that. Um, and and uh, the mathematics is just uh, incredible. So, well, that ties in nicely to my final question, which is if you could do it all over again, what would you keep the same and what would you change? <laughs> okay, well, I'd still be a scientist for, for sure. <laughs> I I I, um, I good, still good, think, good. I still think um, that I would have chose I chose correctly to go into cardiac science at that point because I don't think the other sciences were 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 ready for anything interesting that, that I wanted to go into there were other things obviously but the ones that I wanted to go into I I think as I say that um, I would have I would have um, I would have kept up with the mathematical advances that would have been my thing that i should have done and, and and because i didn't quite get in there at the right time then and i was doing a lot of other things i never put the attention in there that they, they really i really needed for that okay
Well, that was truly fascinating and lighthearted, Sean. I um, I can't thank you enough for giving up your time to do this. Thank you. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Please make sure to keep subscribing and engaging with us on our Twitter and YouTube platforms and rate us on your podcast platforms. This helps us out a huge deal with metrics and will be very much appreciated. Our next episode is going to be released in two weeks time, which is Wednesday the 7th of April, and is going to feature Dr. John Tregoning, who will talk to us all about his life and work with a particular focus on RNA vaccines, COVID, and what it's like to be a working parent. Until then, 